Rutgers legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, my friend, to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of EnhanceYourEdge.com, Brad Wilson. And today's special guest is K.L. Cleeton. Born with spinal muscular atrophy type 1, K.L. Cleeton of Southern Illinois has played poker at some level for the past 10 years and has considered himself a professional for the last two and a half. In 2017, he won a contest from Daniel Negreanu and lived his dream of playing in the WSOP main event, ultimately cashing for $16,000. For the last year, he has been coached by one of the very best in the industry, former Chasing Poker Greatness guest Ryan LaPlante, and is a gladiator for one of the most prestigious backing groups in the world, Team 651. In addition to playing, KL has been heavily involved in the launch and continued development of Ryan LaPlante's new tournament poker training site, LearnProPoker.com. Never one to rest on his laurels, after being frustrated that there weren't any resources designed specifically to help players learn and memorize ranges efficiently, KL, along with Matt McElligot, created and launched the app Range Trainer Pro. Officially launched in early December 2019, Range Trainer Pro has high hopes of becoming the go-to tool for players of all levels to improve and stay sharp so that they are always on their A-game. In this episode, you'll learn the mindset that will prevent you from ever achieving poker greatness, why deviating from your strategy without a solid foundation is a recipe for disaster, why KL believes Range Trainer Pro is the best tournament poker training software on the market for learning and memorizing ranges, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you the inspirational KL Cleet. KL, welcome to Chasing Poker Greatness, my friend. How are we doing today? Hey, man, we're doing really good. I appreciate you having me on. I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. My pleasure, sir. And typically start out this show asking your story. Um, What is your story? How did you get involved in poker in the first place? Well, um, it started about 80 years ago. I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, I, I have been playing poker since, oh, man. I'm 30 now, and I was one of the, you know, kids, like, back in the Money Nature days that had the account under their parents' name and was, like, playing under, you know, and I think everybody that is of a certain age in poker probably did that pre-Black Friday, um, just because you were like, man, poker, Money Nature, how is this you know, a real thing? Uh, but I've been taking it seriously for the past three years or so. It all kind of began in the eight to nine months prior to my World Series uh, contest that I won from, from Daniel. And Tell me about that. Tell me about the World Series contest you won from Daniel. Yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, back in 2017, Daniel Radio put on a World Series of Poker uh, video submission contest where he put three people into the main event on a 50-50 stake. And I was one of the very fortunate people that won. And I actually wasn't even going to submit. But the group of friends that I played poker with online, uh, there was about, I don't know, 10, 15 of us that would play uh, and 
video chat or voice call with uh, with Skype, and we would play and have fun, and we were playing on, like, some teeny, tiny crypto site called the, uh, uh, oh, man, it was, it was a Dogecoin site, Poker <laughs> Shibs. It was uh, po- Poker Shibs, or Poker Shibas, however you want to pronounce it, and uh, they were like, you have to submit. So at the very last moment, I had been running a Twitch channel at that point as well and playing a, a few different places and, and kind of taking it seriously, trying to get better, but I still wasn't like great. Uh, but we, we put together a little video, my dad and I, who is uh, you know, kind of like a parent or my primary uh, caregivers, because I need, I need help with basically everything, my condition, uh, spinomuscular atrophy, basically means that it's kind of like being paralyzed from the neck down, but I feel everything. So I just can't move, but I can feel everything. And so like, if I have an itch, I have to have somebody scratch it. Or if I want a drink, I need to have somebody give me a drink. But because my my parents, who I'm really fortunate, not only are my parents my parents, but we're actually kind of unique in that like we're really good friends. Like my dad is you know, probably my best friend. Um and we have a, a good time, like it you know, enjoying each other's company, um, which I'm really fortunate that that we have that sort of uh, relationship other than just you know, familial type of other thing. But we did a video and submitted it, and like I want to say within like, two days, uh, Ryan, or I'm sorry, uh, Daniel retweeted it, and I'm not back up. Hold on. So we did a video, and I want to say that within like two days, Daniel retweeted it and was like, what do we think, everybody? Do we have a winner? And we all lost our collective shit. Like, we went fucking insane. We were like, holy shit. We, uh, you know, like, it wasn't, like, announced. But the way that it was phrased, it was very clear that we had won the seat. And it, it was it was a really cool thing. So we go out there. Um, I can't fly because of uh, of all the stuff that we have to take and whatnot. And so we drive a three day road trip from Central Illinois out to Nevada. Uh, we actually had the van literally break down in Albuquerque on the way out. So it was like a very Bugs Bunny moment for everybody <laughs> that, you know, has seen the old Warner Brothers cartoon, you know, and took a left to Albuquerque. Like, that's, you know, we, we've had to stop in Al- Albuquerque. And, uh, yes, yeah, so we go out. And how, how was the journey? Before we get there, how was the journey with your dad those three days? How, how, how was that process? Mom and dad, um, you know, we go everywhere together. Um, so, Basically, it's, um, you know, drive, you know, basically eight hours or whatever it was, and then we would stop and find a hotel and have to unpack, like, essentially what amounts to a small hospital that we end up bringing with us, uh, you know, with all of my, all of my, shit and gear and so we go to bed and we try and get as much sleep as possible and then do it all over again how are how are the how are the feelings though like the the sense of you're going you're going on this adventure like the the excitement how is that it doesn't really hit you until you we went through you can get to vegas two ways from where we live you can go south and go through like the desert, New Mexico, and 
and uh, Arizona and all that, or you can go through the mountains, through Colorado and, and all that. We elected to go south, um, flatter, and when you're on the highway, the, the two-lane, or well, it's technically a four-lane, but that connects the interstate to Vegas, that's just south of, of Vegas, there's like a hundred mile stretch and you come into Nevada and then you end up going through like a few small towns and then you go by, I forget what dam it is, but you go by and then there's a moment where you- It's a Hoover dam, up. right? I don't know, but I don't think it was the Hoover. Not the Hoover. I think the Hoover's, yeah, I think the Hoover's uh, a little bit further north. But there's a moment where you're coming through a mountain pass, and you go up and over, and then, boom, it's right there. And you can, you know, I mean, it's something flat as a, a pancake <laughs> after, you get, after you get beyond that point. And so out in front of you, you can see Vegas. I mean, it's still like 15, 20 miles away, but you can see it. I mean, it's just there. And it was it was exciting. Obviously, we were pumped, but we were so wrapped up in the getting there that it kind of doesn't really hit you until you crest that, that last hill come through and it's like it's like you're you're birthing into possibilities. You know, it's like, oh shit, there's a literal road laid out in front of you. And it's it's kind of analogous to I think what a lot of poker players feel is the summer schedule. Like the possibilities are there. You know, there are opportunities and and you hope that the world, so to speak, is your oyster. And that, it, that kind of is what it feels like when you're coming over it. it it's suddenly in your face and it's real in that moment. And it was at that point that I got a little like, holy shit, this is exciting. This is amazing. This is, you know, indescribable. Um, it was a very cool thing because even though we did have those issues on the way out, we actually got there a day ahead of time. Oh, well, I'm sorry, two days ahead of time. So I was able to take in the ambiance without playing yet, which I think was a really big deal because I'd never played live poker at any reasonable level. I've been to a few, like, local uh, uh, like mid-major series when they would travel through and, and come to St. Louis, which is about 100 miles from where I live. But those were always, like, side events, and there would be, you know, two or 300 people in them. This was... You know, this is the main event. It's it's what some professionals don't even get to play uh, in their entire career. And having that day to kind of go and be and experience and absorb was really valuable for me because it allowed me to not get overwhelmed by the moment and just try to play reasonably decent poker, um, which was very, very needed considering that my first two table draws were far less than ideal. Let's just say that. Um, uh, The new GTO book, uh, Modern Poker Theory, by uh, Michael Acevedo, he was on my right for day two. So uh, having guys like that, and there's you know, a few uh, Eastern Europeans that were to his right, 
somebody that had won a bracelet like a week before uh, and had only cashed for something like over a half a million. That series was there. Um, Harrison Gimble was at my table. You know, like sicko Harrison Gimble actually bluffed him in a hand um, where I had no business being in the hand. <laughs> no, I had no business bluffing, I should say. But it was one of those things where when you're in the moment, I don't think you realize what what you're doing and what this means. But then you go back and look, and, and I, I do. I mean, I'm, I'm a narcissist. I'll, I'll admit it. Yeah, you know, I'll go back and, and watch the videos every now and then just to remind myself that, hey, you weren't always terrible at poker. Sometimes you were good. Um, but I don't think any real poker player, if they tell you they never had a crisis of confidence, then they're lying to you. Um, I think every poker player has went through that stretch where you're like, I'm terrible, you know, blah, 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 why do I play this game? But I'm really lucky because I have things that are in the public domain that I can go back to and say, no, it's just you know, it's just variant or, you know, you need to get back to basics. But, you know, having having that realization was not in the moment uh, during playing. And I think that was really valuable because it allowed me to not play scared, um, not be like, oh, I need to wait for aces or, or you know. Before you, before you hopped in the main event, I mean, so Daniel put you in. Does he give you any coaching, talk to you? Um, no, actually, Daniel was really, really, really busy. Um, he was, I think that was the year that he multi-tabled for a minute um, on, on accident. And so his like manager business guy, Christian Sanchez, who Christian is like, an amazing person. He's incredibly kind and thoughtful and just like just a, a really good dude overall. Um a, a amazing human being. And you know, he came up to the hotel room to we stay at the at the Rio. It was really important that we stay at the Rio because all of the stuff that we have to do to get ready and go to bed, you know, you're playing for twelve hours. And then you still have to sleep. So having every minute that we could saved was valuable. So he comes up and you know he welcomes us and obviously apologizes. Hey, Daniel, sorry, to be here. He's you know, playing or whatever he was doing. And uh, you know, we're like, no, I mean, it's fine. We understand totally. And uh, we're not like. Well, like my, my family and I, we're not like, well, off. We're, we're, you know, not, that's not who we are. He comes up, he's got a backpack. He opens the backpack up, and there's just like a stack, like, there's multiple stacks in it. But he just pulls out a stack and goes, here you go, here's the buy in. And we're like, uh, what's that now? <laughs> Uh, we didn't know how it was going to work. We had no idea. We'd never done this before. But we assumed that, like, oh, they had made arrangements with the, the cage or something, and they had the money, and we would just go down and show ID or something. It's like, no, just take this, and whatever you want to buy in, go buy in. It's fine. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> and we're like, uh, what's that? Hey, yeah, good. just uh, w- w- welcome to the world of poker. These backpacks, yeah. are, they're not fashion statements. They're actually just all full of cash that we just mm-hmm. hand away. Just straight cash. And it's funny because I see that, like, it's one of the things where like, you see it online, but like, when it's happening right in front of you, it's a whole different thing. And the reason I say that is because before we had left earlier that year, um, at the beginning of the year, summer schedule, I saw a video of some European dude who was just off the plane 
apparently had done all of his uh, conversion, his uh, whatever his, I'm assuming it was a euro to um, to U.S. dollar back in his home country. And he came and he had a literal pile of money. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it. It was like a giant, you know, in uh, movies when you see like a drug uh, deal and like it's just a massive wad, or not wad, but like brick of money and it's in cellophane wrap. It's like wrapped up in, in cellophane. That's literally what this was. And the video was him trying to break open the cellophane so he could <laughs> buy in because he hadn't had time to go back to wherever he was staying, the Airbnb or whatever, and organize. So he just had a suitcase, not a backpack, a literal suitcase with like a three foot by two foot by two foot, you know, cube of of money that he was trying to break open so he could get you know, ten grand or whatever <laughs> to, to buy in yeah. or something. It was just like holy bananas. That is that's insane. But yeah, it's it's something that we were not like used to, and it was a big uh, culture shock when we when we experienced it. I would say for most folks, that is a pretty big culture shock when you experience it firsthand. Um, how'd you end up doing in the main event? So I ended up uh, making one page jump. I always forget, but I'll tell you who does not forget what place I got, and that is my dad. You can ask him about my, my, my run, and with great pride, he always says, my son finished, I want to say it was something like 731st or something out of 7,000, so on, so many. I don't remember. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I have no idea. But he always, with great pride, goes you know, into that. And uh, we made one page jump. I, I'm not making excuses because I don't think... That is a reasonable thing to do. But I will give context. We burst the bubble at around 2 a.m. on day three. And then they didn't move back day four at all. And so we had to be back you know, relatively early the next day. Um, and unfortunately, the end of day three to beginning of day four, I was starting to get a really terrible cold. Like, just awful, like the Vegas flu type of thing. And so I ended up through that jamming sevens with like 19 big ones, but I just should have never been so. But not that that's not a fine hand to do it, but like in the exact scenario where it was middle-aged, likely recreational player, three X's under the gun. And Mike, I'm just doing dead versus that range. So, I mean, just fold and move on, or I guess maybe peel. Um, but, like I said, context, I was super sick and probably subconsciously in the back of my head had a bit of like, I even want to build up some chips and give myself a chance at like a top. 200 or 150 run or you know try and make something happen i didn't think that consciously in the moment but i think probably self-evaluating afterwards that may have been like my subconscious line of thinking uh but you know it's one of those things where if i could do it differently i definitely would yeah, but that's pretty much most every poker session that I've ever played. There are always the spots where if you could do it differently, you would. But there is a lot it's a to be said of incomplete for incomplete information. Yeah, it's it's when you're not feeling well, when you have a cold, when you're feeling sick, this affects every single human being on the planet's 
thought processes and decision making, the way that they handled their emotions. Um, poker is a very emotional, high pressure game anyway. So then when you're not feeling well, you know, like if you have a cold and you're sitting around the house and like somebody like touches you or moves you and you're like, hey, fuck, like stop, leave me alone. Don't like, exactly. you know, that, then you, you throw that in, into a massive, you know, the main event. Um, of course, you, it's going to affect your thought processes, your cognitive ability, and it's tough to perform at at a super high level, quite frankly. It, it really is. And, I mean, I, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly, I understand, do not believe in, you know, making excuses or anything like that because of my situation. That's why I play poker, because poker is the great equalizer and it doesn't matter what your physical ability level is it just matters that you can outthink having said all that whenever i get sick it's just by definition of who i am it impacts someone with you know a, a, a weaker immune system a little bit differently and so you're absolutely 110 percent correct whenever who are having to devote mental energy to this other thing, and you're not able to devote a hundred percent of your focus to every single spot. It only takes one moment for uh, for you know a mistake to happen. And fortunately, mine cost me. You know, my turn at life. I uh, I, I wanted. I live in Niceville, say, but it was always coming sevens. And, uh, you know, just think to set and then be at, you know, 40 big lines or whatever and, and, and be in a really good spot. But, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, not to be. And I know that next time I'll, I know what adjustments I need to make to make sure that I'm playing at my A plus number one, you know, peak ability level and who knows maybe i'll just uh run deep in the next one and see everybody at espn don't don't get the uh the vegas flu number one um exactly, exactly. see if you can fade uh, that and then so i want to be the next jerry G- or, uh, gary gates i mean you know, gary was i think the quintessential what poker players who were in the industry uh it was a really, really cool moment because he's obviously been in and around poker for years with stars and managing, but seeing him succeed at a, at a level like that was really who a, is a Gary cool Gates? Because I don't know, and that so might he be was, embarrassing. He was the no, it's uh, he was the guy who ran a lot of poker stars uh, pro. Um, stuff for a really long time. So, like streamers that are are or were stars pros, um, like he would manage a lot of that stuff, a lot of like the marketing, publicity, and stuff like that. He recently, uh, I just saw, officially left um, uh, and and is moving on to you know his next adventure. But I know from second-hand knowledge that he was just what you saw on TV that's who he is in real life Ooh. he's just a genuinely nice cool you know uh, uh, a good human being um, which I say that but like whenever I say that about people it's actually like it's very hard for me to say that about people like you have had to do something in order for me to say that about someone, because they got to earn it, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's it's a rare it's a rare trait, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I I don't know him personally at all. In fact, I don't think I've ever even interacted with him in a meaningful way, other than Twitter and whatnot. But I've personally been a fan um, just because I think he is good for poker and exactly the type of people that we want representing poker to the masses. What did he do? Did he run deep in the main? What did he do? Yeah, he, uh, he had third or fourth last year. 
Oh, that's pretty good. I guess that's that's yeah. fairly deep. If I mean, I mean it's fine. It's fine. You, I mean, he didn't win. He didn't get heads up. I mean, that yeah. would have been a good one. If you want to be yeah. generous, I guess third or fourth is like okay. It's okay. Yeah, I don't remember it precisely. Um, I mean, we could look it up. Obviously, <laughs> I don't remember what the order was. But yeah, he uh, he, you know, he made uh, he made life changing money. Which, you know, at the end of the day, everybody who final tables, the main event, theoretically, probably made life-changing money, even if they sold most of themselves, they probably made life-changing money. At the very least, they are not in makeup anymore. So, <laughs> and they I can mean, put uh, final WSOP final table in their Twitter bio to give exactly. them some instant credibility. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, but, I mean, just overall, I love poker. I, I give a shit about not just, like, the, the game itself, but making the game approachable to people who don't currently play or maybe don't play a lot. Um, that, that's a big deal to me. I think that's a really valuable thing that we as an industry don't do a good job of. But he is exactly the type of person that we would want representing us on national TV. I mean, obviously, you know, we've got the the Euro guys who are undoubtedly amazing at the game. They are very, very good players. Um, But I, I think most people would agree that most of them aren't great for TV. You know, there's too much of the tanking and the the sweaters over your face and and all that good stuff. And obviously places have done a good job of cutting down on that. They've implemented, you know, time cl- uh, clocks and, and extension chips. But in general, if we had more people like Gary Gates, um, who are obviously knowledgeable about poker, but don't necessarily pay the light bill with it, um, at least not directly, I think that's a good thing overall uh, for the game and for people who are looking to get into the game. And I know that people are probably going to send me messages and they're like, why do you hate the Euros? And blah, blah, blah. I don't. I love the Euros. I mean, they're really freaking good at the game. They're why, amazing. Why, why did you tell me in the pre-interview that you hated the Euros, though? This- well, I mean, <laughs> I, I told you that because I thought that was private now. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm objective enough that I can realize that someone can be really good at poker but be bad for poker. There's a very big difference between being good at the game and being good for the game. And I think if we had more people that at least attempt to find a balance in that, you know, being good while at the same time being good for, if they would put just 5% of their off table energy into that, then you know who the fuck knows might happen. You know what, what might happen with poker. I mean, Daniel Negreanu is a great example of being good for the game and being at the game. I think he exactly. always has, and that's probably why he's one of the the faces of the game. Is that he's always personable, outgoing, seems to be having a good time while also being a fierce competitor. And you know, playing at a world class level, sustained world class level, and exactly. and he's yeah. also not afraid to admit, like he did um, last year or the year before, that hey, I'm falling behind. He spent time in the lab, you know, learned a lot. He, he documented some of it on his his social media accounts. Um, and obviously turned that into a uh, a great run at the uh, 
uh, Poker Masters uh, 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 the, year, the, the year before. I will say this, though, in regards to that, is if there's a poker player that's out there that says – they're keeping up with the game. That says oh, wait, yeah. th- that says that says they are th- that says they're not improving. That they're like at the peak of their game and they're not studying. They're not doing the stuff. I will tell you, this player is not destined for greatness. Like th- even though no matter what the results are, they're going to fall behind. Like and, and they ought to have humility. And I think all the all of the best players they do have humility in that they will question do i have an edge am i working on my game am i improving on a regular basis because that humility that that is what gets you there in the first place had daniel at some point in his career say oh i've got it solved i've got it figured out not doing the work anymore he would not have been the daniel negranio that we see on tv that that is the great ambassador of the game and absolutely you know doyle (laughs) all of these guys they they all have this curiosity, they want to learn, they want to be their best self, and that humility can take you so, so, so far in poker. When you say, I've got it solved, no. You, that, that's the first step towards your downfall. So I have a, I have a, a mantra that I will, um, I will repeat quite often. Um, and people who are familiar with firm pro poker will have likely heard this more than they can. Stagnation is equal to regression in poker. If you are stagnant, you are falling backwards. There is no stagnation. You know, people, I I know that a lot of people are big fans of, like, meditation and being present, being in the present. And I agree, I think that's important. However, I don't think you can apply that mentality to the game in the respect of being an improved version of yourself. And so, if you're ever, like you, to your point, if you're ever saying to yourself, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty well right now, you know, let's, uh, let's keep this rolling, but you're not continuing to question and find flaws. Like you said, you're destined to not just regress to the mean, but regress beyond the mean and into negative territory. And that is, uh, it's a big deal. And that's, you can see uh, it. You, you can see, I can, so, you know, I've traveled around, I've played a lot of cash games and you can see it in a very specific player profile. And this is the nineties grinder, the older men mm-hmm. that have their, their strategy. They never question it. They've been making money for, you know, a decade and then they continue playing, and then all of a sudden, they, they have a losing year. And then they have two mm-hmm. losing years, and they think they're just getting so unlucky. They think they're, get, they're, they're running bad. They don't look and analyze their decision-making process. They don't know what to do. They haven't been growing over the years and learning. They've been stagnant, and now all of a sudden, they can't beat the game anymore. And, and it's, it's kind of like, I don't want to be offensive here, but it's like um, Old Man Coffee, but it's the beta version. It's like the <laughs> beta Old Man Coffee. Like they're not there yet, but that, well, they might be. You know, they're with their, their black coffee. But they're <laughs> they're in the, the first stage of Old Man Coffee, where, you know, it like you said, it's it's just there is a there's a difficulty to staying ahead of population because population now has infinitely more tools at their disposal to close the knowledge gap. And when they are closing the knowledge gap, you've got to continue attaining more knowledge for yourself. It's like a uh, like college team in basketball. Uh, you know, basketball uh, in college is a game of runs. And, you know, a team will have a 15-point a lead, and then the other team will go on an 18 to 2 run, and suddenly they're down by one. It's the same type of idea. Just because you may have a big lead right now doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying to 
grow that lead and 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 develop more tools in your arsenal because eventually your opponents are going to go on a run themselves and you need to have a buffer so that way you're always maintaining uh maintaining the edge that you have that is a greatness bomb sir and (laughs) speaking of tools you have a tool so tell me about range trainer pro let's talk about it so it kind of stems from what i said earlier about stagnation equaling regression and what i mean by that was is when i was learning to play the game more seriously i was really lucky because there were a ton of tools available there was you know this was three years ago so that was right around the time razor edge was you know the leader or upswing uh master class was the leader um they were the two main ones obviously we have even more now um there's just if you want to get better there's no reason that you don't have the opportunity to Poker code, but Fedor holds. There's a bunch of them. Learn pro poker. Learn pro poker. Yeah, I'm a big fan of it. Um, anybody who's who's seen me on Twitter, I full disclosure, I am involved with the company, and so you know, I'm a bit biased, but I wouldn't have gotten involved if I didn't think it was kick ass at uh, at what it does. Um, but Unfortunately, all of these sites, no matter what site you want to talk about, they have two things in common. They all give you ranges, but none of them give you a way to learn them. The way that you learn them is effectively the flashcard method. You put the ranges or put it on your screen or whatever it is. You look at the image, you cover it up, and you see how closely you can get to rebuilding it that's not a good way to learn your ranges a that's not what you do when you play like you're not sitting there in your head okay most people don't sit there and close their eyes and imagine a chart and try and fill it in with what their range should look like and then see if if the hand fits that mode like it's just it's really inelegant, um, and it's it's a, a time waste, to be perfectly honest. So, out of that frustration, an idea came to me where you would tell an application what your ranges are. You would say, this is what my range should look like in the hijack on 50 bigs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And then you would get two things out of that app. A, you'd be able to access that range on any device. Right now, most range tools are desktop based. You know, Flopzilla, Power Echo Lab, even Poker Stove is just desktop based. And then even now, some of those, you can't save ranges. Well, with Range Chair Pro, you input your range, and all you need is a phone with a internet connection. That's all you need, and you can get to any range that you have. But more importantly, you need to be able to take that range and then learn it, and learn it in a way that makes sense to you at the table. So what Range Trigger Pro does is it takes all those ranges that you tell it, you want to use, and then there is a training feature, and basically what it does is it gives you a random hand from a seat and stack depth and says, are you going to fold, call, raise, or go all in? And that you can define frequencies for each of those actions in the, the range wherever you input it. And so now, not only are you 
effectively kind of playing a mini poker game, like three flat, where you're looking at an actual poker table with a hand like you would if you were playing online. But you're able to decide how you want to randomize if you are wanting to randomize. So if it's something like a a 50-50 frequency, then, you know, let's say that you want to use the clock as a randomizer. You can physically look at the clock. If you want to use suits as a randomizer, it gives you a literal hand, so you can use suits. Um, And basically, the idea is that you are playing a dumbed-down version of pre-flat poker. So when you're playing the real version of poker, your instincts are much closer to optimal. Because, in my opinion, actively thinking about little decisions takes away from your ability to actively think about big decisions. You know, eventually you get tired. Eventually you are worn down. And the more that you can save and make things a a subconscious, I know this is good, I know this is bad, and, and learn those in the back of your head, the better you're going to be at poker and the more comfortable you're going to be in every situation. I think this is one of the more underrated aspects of using HUDs. And I've done a lot of coaching and my students sometimes will come to me with, uh, you know, like on ignition, they would have a HUD that is just like ungodly, obscene, massive, massive HUD that they're using to guide all of their decisions. Um, Or even in some cases, just make flat out, make the decision for them based on their HUD. And Mm -hmm. I tell them every time, Number one, stop doing that. Number two, the HUD is a good way to collect information and have it at your disposal so that you don't have to actively think about it. So you're not carrying it around in your head. But even then, it's just a guide. It's just something that you can look at and then make decisions based off of. It's not going to it's not going to help you arrive at the optimal conclusion in game for the most part. Um, I guess it depends on how insane your HUD is or what it's doing. Yeah. Like I know, I know that there were like heat maps and stuff for hold a manager um, a few years ago, but basically the point is like it's automatically collecting the information for you so that you don't have to hold it in your head. And it seems to me like range trainer pro you're taking an active participation in you know, getting some reps in so that you're properly trained at the table and these decisions that may cause you to spend energy and brain power on are a little more automatic so that you can think you can you can take in the full picture to make better decisions. A hundred and ten percent that. But also you know, I'm you know, I, I'm a tournament guy. I mean that that's I'm you know, I know that you're a task guy and I would not do well in your world at all. It would take me a long time to make that transition. And so being a tournament guy, I have my ranges, obviously, but we've got ranges for fucking everything. We've got ranges for 100, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 17, 15. You know, I mean, and even when you get down into the 20 to 15 range, they're still not just push full ranges. I mean, they're still absolutely ways folding off of that stack. I mean, all sorts of stuff. And having the ability to even put just a little bit and put the work in away from the table. So like you said, you're reserving that mental energy for the the tougher, you know, turn spots or river spots. Whatever it may be. But also because I'm a tournament player my ranges aren't always static. They obviously change depending on who's behind and what those stats look like and whether I think they're a fun player or a decent player. But in order to deviate from what my range should look like, 
I first need to know what it should look like in the first place. You can't break the rules unless you know what the rules are to begin with. And that is, you know, that's another kind of aspect that I think goes maybe unrecognized with the app because people are like, well, if we're on the, you know, let's say the on the button, the the GTO range is 60% ends. But you're saying that when you're on the button and you have certain types of players in the blinds, you're raising 100%. Like, you get dealt two napkins and you raise. Like, I mean, why do you even have the ranges to be in with? But the reason I had the ranges is because I know why I'm deviating. I'm deviating because I think my opponents are going to under defend, or I think that my opponents are going to check pulled to a C that obscenely high percentage of the time. And so I can make a you know a profitable uh, exploit in this exact situation. But I can't do that. If I don't first have an understanding of what optimal theoretically should look like, and then how I'm deviating in 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 order to maximize my profitability, I think there's you know, obviously a big debate going on about you know is GTO really GTO? You know, is exploit the way to go? Yada yada yada. And I think a long time ago, Matt Berkey put it the best when he said, they are two sides of the exact same coin. One should influence the other and vice versa. And so when I'm utilizing the app, I'm utilizing it to have a rock solid foundation. So whenever I'm out on a limb, so to speak, I know that I have the, the 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 theoretical knowledge that will act as the foundation to hold me up, even when I am way out there on that limb trying to to stretch and and gain maximum profitability. Um, it it is a very contentious topic: the GTO versus exploitation, yada yada yada. Uh, yeah. My thoughts of pretty much been the same across the board is when you're using an exploit you're using extra data you're inputting extra data into a solver that will mm-hmm. give you a different answer than if you put no information if you're not solving you know you change the solve from going bot versus bot unexploitable bot versus unexploitable bot to exploitable human people will argue yeah you should never fold king's preflop this is just an instance right you should never fold king's preflop gto calculator is going to tell you never fold king's preflop right well if you input into the solver that your opponent has aces 100% of the time what's it going to tell you i think you should fold kings i mean exactly that's a really good way of putting it i love that you're inputting more data that's, it, you're inputting that's the your super valuable you humanize it. You're humanizing the process to where you look at their tendencies that deviate from what should happen, and then you make a decision based on that. Even I would say, even like the quote unquote like feel players that um, get talked down to a lot, like on poker forums and stuff like that, understand theoretical poker. They have to understand theoretical poker because if they didn't, they wouldn't be able to deviate and exploit opponent's tendency so whether they do it intuitively whether they can express it um you know i I see on forum posts where people say things like oh you know back in the day in poker when they put somebody on one hand and that was the goal to put somebody on one hand and it's like dude i've been in this game a long time never in the never has that been the fucking case like yeah maybe they don't speak in the exact terminology of ranges but the logical deduction process always involved my opponent could have this, 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 or this, or this. Sometimes they have this. Can we eliminate this? Like there is still a hand ranging process that was involved the whole time. So don't just, you know, show up here in 2009 and say, oh my God, if I played poker back in 2004, I would have been a multimillionaire and would have just crushed the world. Let me tell you, if you're not crushing the world now, 
you wouldn't have fucking crushed the world back then because information was not as readily available and the folks that understood theoretical sound poker were the crushers. So anyway. What is up my loyal Chasing Poker Greatness listener? Coach Brad here and I just wanted to take a moment to ask you a simple question. How many times have you heard my guests and I speak passionately about the benefits of poker coaching? You get to expand your poker network, receive expert feedback you can rely on, and have your burning questions answered by a trusted mentor. Which brings me to the Poker Power Hour, a series of 100% free live one-hour poker webinars, masterclasses, and hand history breakdowns that kick off each and every Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Poker Power Hour will be led by me, Coach Brad, as well as some of your favorite Chasing Poker Greatness guests. It will be your weekly guide for helping you plug your leaks, skyrocket your poker growth, expand your network of crushers, and inevitably win more money on the green felt. The Poker Power Hour is premium content and live only. There will be no free replays or view on demand, and the content will eventually be released as paid training only. So head to EnhanceYourEdge.com, opt in to the Poker Power Hour, and get for free today what you'll have to pay for it later. Once again, to catch the Poker Power Hour every single week, head to EnhanceYourEdge.com and join the email newsletter. Now, back to the show. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I, I think that I, I said this quite a while ago um, in response to, I think it was a Doug Polk video talking about and defending GTO. He put out one, I don't know, probably a year, year and a half ago. And it was, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but if I remember correctly, the thrust of the argument was, Basically, I'm teaching people GTO because it's easily replicated and it's something that everybody can learn with enough, you know, mental energy. Um, you know, learning charts and yeah, yeah, yeah. My response was, GTO is going to make you money, but exploits are going to make you more money. That was kind of my reasoning. Like, if you want to, if you're getting started and you're learning poker, and when I say learning poker, I mean learning it, not just like what hands beat what, but I mean learning what the nuances of the game are. You should absolutely start out with a game theoretical foundation. Because that's going to be the easiest way to close the knowledge gap. It's going to be the easiest way to make yourself at least quasi-competitive. But if you want to take your ROI from 20% to 80 you have to start implementing stuff other than just pure... GTO. And when I say that, I mean things like overfolding when you're bet into on the river, or folding basically everything but the nuts or second nuts when you get check raised on the river. Because in general, population doesn't bluff the river. Like, you know, obviously you have a few to do, but in general, you are probably going to make more money by deviating from GTO uh, by by making little adjustments like that. And so this whole argument of what is better and what isn't better, it just seems like a, a, a kind of a, a fallacy to me because, you know, th- they're the same gen- general idea. It's all poker. It's just about when do you implement one and when do you implement the other or when do you use a mix and how do you do so uh, effectively? And if you can do those things, you're going to succeed at a really high level. And 
just understand people, right? Have a good theoretical understanding of the game, understand incentives, understand people, try to put yourself in their spot and ask yourself, why are they doing this? What is their objective? What do they think of me? Like this human being that you're playing against, they're not, unless you run into the top 0.00001% of players in a super high roller, people are going to have patterns that you can exploit because they are human beings. They're not going to be randomizing at any, at, at, in any spots. The, the only randomization that they do is uh, back in the day, Mike Caro called it loose wiring and that's, they choose different options in the same scenario simply because they don't know what they're going to do until they do it. It's like, <laughs> it, it's just completely clicking buttons going back to my early days of playing no limit. Hold them. Yeah, I had read books. I did understand like preflop opening strategy and stuff like that. But I'll never forget a day on the boat where I was battling in a no limit cash game against one player who's playing too many hands who had a clear physical tell where whenever I would go to bet, he would grab at his chips every single time and it always meant weakness and he never he never got over it. He never figured it out, right? So on the boat, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're in the, they're in the yeah. yeah, it's like it's like okay, so who cares about theory? Who cares about anything? Nothing else matters in this moment other than what I'm going to bet is this dude grabbing it, grabbing his chips in a threatening way or not. And when he did, and I was bluffing, then I would bluff. And when I went to grab chips and he he didn't do it, then I would not bet. Because I knew he was going to call. And if, when I have a monster and I go to bet and he doesn't, then I'm going to pump the living shit out of the pot because I know he's never folding. So you you exploit the human tendency. You don't even need to know hardly any theory about anything to battle a person like that. So, you know, that's yeah, a, that's an extreme example, obviously. But the reality is everybody's fallible. Everybody has patterns. And if you're paying attention... If you're if you're fortunate enough to spot a physical tell like that that you can exploit, throw everything out the window and do that against that player. That's going to be the most profitable. One hundred percent. And you know, online, uh, they so we, we don't un- unfortunately don't have the advantage of that, but we do have the advantage of knowing and understanding what population tends to do and also if they have a reasonable sample on someone if they somehow are able to get 500 hands on a, a tournament rig or something which is not easy to do because tournaments but you know, if they're able to do that we've got so much more information that we at least can look at and decide whether we want to allow that information to influence our decision or not. Um, and I think you mentioned it earlier that people overuse the HUD for some stuff, but I think they underuse the HUD for other stuff. And a really plain example is VTIP, PFR, and 3 that are stats that you don't need that many hands to draw a reasonable assumption on what type of player someone is. You know, you only you only need fifty or eighty hands to have some sort of idea for sometimes, those three sometimes thirteen hands, you can tell. Exactly. You, can, you can get a pro exactly. player profile pretty quickly. A hundred percent with those three stats. And everybody's like, well, I'm gonna know like what their term check raise is and all that shit. Like, no you don't. Because A there's almost no chance that you have enough hands to actually draw a reasonable sample to have an informed decision. But if you've got somebody with a, a VPET PSR gap of like 19 or 20, guess what? They're loose passive or tight passive, depending on what the, the VPET is. And when they bet river, that's what they have. They have the Nuts. So it, it, it's not only that there's not enough hands, it's that even if you have a bunch of hands, board textures are different. Situations mm-hmm. are different. Po- positionally, 
things can be different. You can open under the gun versus the big blind. They can be defending versus a button. They can be, you know, you can have <laughs> samples of them defending versus a button who's over C betting. There can be monotone boards. There can be, uh, you know, six, seven, eight boards, seven, eight boards, um, you know, rainbow <laughs> ace high flops, rainbow king, rainbow king high flops. Like, you, you can't just throw all these into a bucket and say, well, this guy check raises the turn 32% of the time and think yeah. that this is going to lead you to some sort of accurate decision point. Like it's there just, is, there is basically no world that exists other than maybe mid the high stakes online cash games where you're playing people day in, day out or the ever shrinking sit and go pool. Like, those are probably the only places where you're going to develop sample sizes of a of large enough number of hands that you get anywhere near a statistically significant, you know, expectation that you might be somewhat accurate in, in your, your reasoning. But, like... Be yeah, a Hamilton. human being, guys. Be human beings. Like, use your exactly. freaking head. You You have the most complex thing in the existence that we've ever found in the universe in your brain fucking use it don't rely on these numbers on a screen to make your decision if it were so easy that you could rely on this hud to make your decisions for you poker would have been uh, poker would have been unbeatable you know 10 years ago it's just not just not the case it's 100 percent that and so well my goal you know kind of bringing this full circle if you're putting the uh the Shameless replug. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my goal with the app is to basically make people's decision trees simplified in game. I, I want to make your decision tree easier in game to manage. I want to make the decision tree very, very difficult off the table. Them, which is why in the training we have options for weights and you get scores based on how close you get to the appropriate weight, which is really valuable, I think. Um, and so if there are any musicians out there, it's like whenever you play guitar and you're playing a particularly difficult piece, but you play it like three times speed or you know whatever you play at insanely high speed and then when you slow down and play it at like the speed it's supposed to be played at hey it's not that hard now because i've practiced it at this really difficult speed but now it's uh it feels slow even though it might be still very very fast and so it's the same idea with the training feature. My goal is to make it where you can relatively easily commit to putting in a training session every day. A training session is designed to be 50 individual instances. And we've found that's the perfect balance between getting a nice, effective warm-up or study session, depending on what you're trying to do, but also keeping it to a reasonable amount of time. So you're not sitting there for an hour. You know, you can go through 50 questions in, like, 10 minutes or less. You know, in fact, I went through 50 questions the other day, and me using my... Uh, mouse, which is with my my face, I was able to get through fifty questions in. I timed myself. I think it was like four minutes and thirty five seconds. <laughs> so I mean, and I wasn't even trying to go fast. It was just you know, I, I wanted to know, hey, how long is it reasonable to say this would take? And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that is because it's something that everyone can commit to. You know, people commit to meditating or going to the gym or, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to to do to make 
you know, yourself a better human being. This, hopefully at least, is something that you can very easily uh, implement into your your daily routine. And I have the utmost confidence that if you're able to use it regularly, you're absolutely going to notice a difference. I'm not going to promise you you will make more money because that would be irresponsible of me. Like I can't control variants. You know, I can't I can't make you get aces more often. What I can do is make you feel more comfortable in situations. So that way you are playing optimally more often. And if you use this to like warm up before a live session, you're playing optimally from day I'm sorry, from uh, from hand one instead of maybe taking five or six hands or an orbit or a level if you're playing tournaments to kind of like get settled in and get your brain going and, and get things firing on all cylinders. But if you're playing tournaments, you don't have time for that. The blinds are going up. The clock is ticking. Warm up beforehand and play your A-plus game from hand number one, not hand number ten. And I would say that you're being a, a little too humble here. I would say that if you are warmed up, if you are making better decisions, at the end of the day, you are going to make more money. Whether that means if you're a losing player, <laughs> you may lose, you may lose a little less money. But anything that improves your decision making process makes it more automatic, so you can think about the bigger picture more easily. Is going to improve your win rate, whatever that is, which does translate eventually to winnings at the poker table. And what's the URL for that, sir? So it's rangetrainerpro.com. R A N G E trainer. P-R-O-Pro.com. Nice. So it's super, uh, super easy. You can also find it in my bio on my Twitter at highhands.com. And I do want to mention that, like, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Like, I give a damn about the poker community. And so this app is designed, like, for poker players. And by extension, that means it's designed by poker players. So if you have something that you want to see implemented, or you have an idea or uh, anything at all that would make it more valuable to you as a user, I want to hear about it. I'm not going to guarantee we'll put it in, because at the end of the day, my business partner, Matt uh, McElligot, who is the uh, uh, coder behind the app. He is the guy who is a savant with uh, with all of the ones and zeros, if you will. He is he's so excited because we've already gotten feedback on ways that people are using it that we didn't expect. And so if there's something that you're doing that you feel like a different feature would make it more valuable to you. We want to hear about it. We want to have a conversation with you. And again, I can't guarantee that it will be implemented, but I can guarantee we're going to be very appreciative for the feedback. Yes. What Kale's saying is if you if you send in a shit idea it's not going to go through, guys. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> but, but if you send in a, a, a good idea, that makes a lot of sense. If you send in a good idea, then uh, who knows? Maybe we'll put it in and uh, maybe even like, uh, throw you a, a month or two of, uh, of premium as a, as a thank you. Because we, we give a damn about making it better. And eventually, I'm hoping that uh, people will looked at the app as a one-stop for almost anything poker-related. So you need to run an equity calculation of range versus range or hand versus range. 
just like four or five taps on your thumb or your, uh, your mouse, and you can do that, no problem. So all sorts of planned updates um, that we're very excited about. And to be perfectly honest with you, I, I'm to the point where I've got more ideas than I, I'm not sure if we can implement all of them. So we'll probably be reaching out to the community, asking for help on prioritization. So I'm going to basically rob Young this shit and just post a bunch of uh, polls like he does for, for Party Poker and be like, all right, guys, what do you want to see next? A, B, or C. And uh, so we're, uh, we're very invested in hearing what the community and what the users have to say. Awesome, man. Uh, I have the utmost confidence in you and your team, Ryan LaPlant, uh, the squad that you got behind you to optimize this tool and make it of extreme value to everybody in the poker community. I got. I appreciate that. I have just a couple more questions, and then yeah, uh, we'll get the show on the road. If you could erect a billboard, every poker player has got to drive past on their way to the casino. What does it say? Play faster. <laughs> That's a good I mean, one. I, I, I agree. I, I, I don't mind headphones. That doesn't bother me. I don't mind glasses at all. That doesn't bother me. I think, in fact, I just bought a pair of prescription lens glasses because I'm blind um, and uh, I'm blind without my glasses but I plan to wear sunglasses next time because uh, I don't know if other people can identify with this but I had this really weird like social thing where when I'm looking at someone and they see me looking at them like I immediately look away it's to- totally involuntary, 100% involuntary, but it's just like instinct. I immediately look away, and I think that is uh, good, bad, or indifferent. I'm not sure. I-, I just don't like that. So I'm hoping that wearing uh, glasses will maybe alleviate that a little bit. I guess I say all that to say, hey, don't hate sunglasses so much. Headphones, okay. I can make that argument, but you know, some of us just want to look really cool at the table and be like badasses. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, play faster. Absolutely that. So now I understand why you haven't looked at me the whole interview because I'm staring right at you. That's that's <laughs> the key, right? <laughs> hey, we need some that, sunglasses for this interview. I'm actually looking right at you. I'm looking right <laughs> at, the, uh, at the camera. It's just you're not in front of the camera. <laughs> Uh, that's man. funny yeah. that's a good point it's uh no I'm just messing with you um, no, no, it's, it's a good point though as I am I'm looking at you you know trying to make eye contact but that eye contact is above my monitor <laughs> looking at the camera and yeah. uh, you're nowhere near that so yeah that's a really interesting point I hadn't considered that so final question where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience where can they find you on the World Wide Web. So Twitter um, at HighHand89. Uh, that's with two H's in the middle. So H-I-G-H-H-A-N-D-S-8-9. And then RangeTrainerPro.com. And also I am always in the Learn Pro Poker Discord. I have the fancy orange username because... I am a uh, admin in there. So, uh, yeah, if you guys need to reach out about anything, I'm always eager to talk about most things. But, you know, don't be offended if I, uh, you know, make fun of you or, you know, say something really, really, really sarcastic. If you can't <laughs> handle, if you can't handle sarcasm, probably don't reach out. But if you're cool with it, then, Hang out and uh, maybe we can uh, chat like uh, Brad and I did. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I've really enjoyed 
our conversation, head to the Discord, rangetrainerpro.com. KL, you are an asset to the poker world. It has been very awesome having you on. I'm grateful for your time, for your energy, and I will catch you next time, my friend. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody out there for listening. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.